All right, we're in 1 Peter chapter 2. We have been working through, for those who may be visiting with us today, we're doing kind of an interim series right now in our morning worship service through our church covenant. Church covenant, I have a copy of it here. Uh, here. It's in, the, in our church documents as well. It's one of our, our documents uh, as a church body, which is, as a covenant, would lead us to think. They are, it is a statement that we, as members of Abundant Life Baptist Church, have agreed to um, be and do for one another. And each of the statements that comes up in our church covenant in the uh, in notes has a passage or several passages of scripture that go along with us. So it's not something, while it's, yes, extra biblical in the sense, we, we don't have a verse in the Bible that talks about a covenant, a church covenant that any church entered into, Every portion of the church covenant is biblical. And as I said in the, in the introductory message, the idea of covenants is a biblical thing. God entered into many covenants with his people, uh, both Old Testament and New. We are in the midst of a new covenant that God has entered into with us through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we saw that whether the term covenant was used or not, we saw that the example of the early church was one of committing themselves to one another and making bold declarations, and not just bold declarations, but living out bold lifestyle to one another uh, as they committed themselves to one another as the people of God. And so we're looking at this, working our way through it to remind ourselves what is it that we are agreeing to be and do for one another as a local church, and what does the Bible say about that? So we're in the midst of our first paragraph, um, 10 paragraphs in total in this covenant, and we're just in the first, but we're going to finish it up today. And the text I want to use is the one that's referenced in our, uh, our church covenant, and that's in 2 Peter chapter 2. Um, I think our covenant only references verses 9 and 10, which will be the thing that we spend the most time on this morning, but I want to at least go back to verse 4 and read those verses because it all comes in, in connection with one another. So beginning in verse 4, Peter, writing to these Christians, says, "...coming to him," and the him here is Jesus Christ... Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, so speaking to the members of this church or these churches, speaking to them, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. And he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. They said a couple weeks ago when I began looking at the first paragraph, I originally had thought to do it all in one sermon. We've split it up into three now, so I took that title that was going to be one title and just broke it up into its three parts. And so the final portion of that is bound together. That's my title for this morning's mission. We are bound together together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have here in this worship service to gather and focus our attention upon you. It's been a busy week, been a hectic week. Some things that we rejoice in that we experienced this week, some things we lament that we went through this week. Father, we have attempted, I pray all of us have attempted to be mindful of you and to worship you in our lives throughout each and every experience that we went through this week. But I am so thankful that you set aside from the very creation week the concept of there being a day in each week that would be set aside for not only rest, so a cessation of the regular work that we normally undertake on a daily basis, but also a day of reflection, a day of worship, a day of praise, a day to draw close to you, to learn of you. In our Christian forefathers there at the very inception of the church 2,000 years ago established that it would be this day, a Sunday, the first day of the week, the week, the day of the week that the Lord Jesus was resurrected from the grave, that this would be the day that we would meet together for our worship and service. And 
learning more of you. So that's what we're here for, and that's our prayer, and I trust that you've been honored and glorified through our worship this morning. I'm thankful for the message of these hymns that we've sung that have caused us to reflect upon your incredible love for us. And as we come now to your word and look at this portion of scripture, and specifically at least one element that it teaches us here about what is going on within the lives of those that have been graciously saved through faith in Jesus Christ, I pray that we would be able to understand the truth here and, and to receive it for what it is, and then to act upon it in the way I think it logically would tell us uh, we must react. So I pray that you would do that for us. I pray your spirit would be actively at work in our hearts and minds. I pray that he would open the word to us and help us to not only understand it, but then to receive and obey it. And I know if we do those things, then we are honoring you. We are worshiping you. We are glorifying you with our lives. And so may that be the case. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, we're going to be considering this morning the third, and I promise, the final message in this first paragraph of our church's covenant. I had attended, as I said, also to, to do it all in one sermon, but I couldn't. It didn't work, so we're, we're bringing it down. But I want to also say this. I still have a goal that hopefully, maybe, maybe, as we go forward, we might be able to do a, a paragraph on a Sunday. That would be wonderful if we can. Um, I'm going to try to keep it as condensed as we can so it's manageable and helpful for us. I certainly don't want it to be tedious. But as I was thinking about that at my office this morning, I also want to say this. Every once in a while, I think it's good to say things like this just to make sure we're all on the same page. I struggle when I'm preaching. It's like, okay, how much time do we spend here? You know, it's like, how much is helpful? How much is too much? How much is overload? How much are people going to turn off and not pay attention anymore? I'm always wrestling with that in my own mind, and I haven't come up with good conclusions one way or the other, as I'm sure you're aware. But as I sometimes find myself saying, maybe I shouldn't be taking this much time, there's also a part of me that says, what good is a sermon if it doesn't accurately and sufficiently deal with the text? What really is the point? I don't preach sermons for preaching sermons' sake. I attempt to preach sermons because I believe that's what God would have pastors to do and try to do this in order to uh, draw our attention to biblical truth and help us understand what God's expectations are and how we can meet them. And I would trust that you don't spend time coming to a church service listening to sermons just so you can check off some spiritual box at the end of the week and say, oh, I've done my duty for this week as a Christian. I trust that you're coming, that you are putting yourself under the sound of the preaching of the Word of God, that you're listening because your desire is to say what? I want to know God's Word more. I want to understand God's truth more. I want to know what His expectations are for my life. I want to know how I might please Him in my lives. So while I don't want to be tedious, and I really don't, I try to make sure I, I am not, I realize each person is going to evaluate that differently, and you may be saying, Pastor, you're just spending too much time on something like this. I apologize. I'm not trying to be tedious. But I also don't want to be trivial about God's Word. This is the Word of God. And we dare not just quickly brush over it and act as if it doesn't matter. It does matter. And we need to make sure that we understand it and reverence it for what it is. So if it takes us a little bit longer to work our way through a passage or a book or a topic, then from my opinion, so be it. As long as, as we're doing this, we are gaining spiritual insight and placing ourselves in a position to benefit from God's Word. So I hope that's your viewpoint. It certainly is mine. Now, the first paragraph of our church's covenant reads this way. Having been led, as we believe, by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, being made by God into a holy nation, a royal priesthood, and a people of God's own choosing, we do now joyfully affirm our covenant together. So far in this exploration of the first paragraph, we have considered the necessity of the new birth, as our statement said, having been led as we believe by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. And we, to do that, we referenced John chapter 3, where Nicodemus, a, a ruler in Israel, a teacher, a rabbi in Israel, came to Jesus by night, and we don't know what he came for, we don't know exactly what his desire was, but we know what the Lord Jesus knew his need was, and that was that he needed to understand the necessity of the new birth. And so he went over to him, telling him, explaining to him how vital it was that he be born again, because apart from the new birth, no man can see or enter into the kingdom of God. 
last Sunday, we considered the next section of this first paragraph, which is those who have now professed faith in Jesus Christ would then be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we saw that baptism is several things for us according to the Scriptures. It is our first step of obedience as a Christian. It provides our public profession of faith. And we saw how vital it is because Jesus said, if a man denies me before the before men, I'll deny him before the Father. There is a need for us to take ownership of Jesus as our master if we truly have received him as our personal savior. And we also saw that baptism is an outward symbol, a visual testimony of what we are professing has actually happened in internally. So as someone is baptized, as they are lowered under the baptismal waters and raised again, we said we are symbolizing our entrance into our immersion, if you will, into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what we accomplish by faith, it's not being dunked in the water that accomplishes that. The being baptized is a testimony of what has already happened by faith. As we trusted the Lord, as we repented of our sins, as we put our faith and dependence in His finished work of, of uh, salvation on the cross of Calvary, we received the benefits of this. We were immersed into the work of Jesus Christ, His redemptive work on the cross of Calvary. We are symbolizing that through our baptism so everybody can see and understand exactly what it is that has occurred. So that's the first portion of our, of our um, paragraph of our church covenant. It's basically laying the ground rules, right? It's basically saying, okay, we are a group of born-again baptized believers in Jesus Christ. As we said last week at the conclusion of the message, you can't be a member of a New Testament church and not be a born-again baptized believer is just an impossibility because these are prerequisites that the Scriptures themselves put forth. So this Sunday we want to go on and see what this final statement is in our first paragraph, and we want to look at the, uh, the statement that says that we have been made by God, we want to make sure we understand that, made by God into a holy nation, a royal priesthood, and a people of God's own choosing. As I said, our church covenant only references verses 9 and 10 in our text, but I'm going to expand it at least uh, to the verses that we read this morning. We'll actually go back here real briefly into the first portion of 1 Peter so that we understand exactly what was it that brought Peter to make these statements, and then how are they important for us. So let's begin by thinking a little bit about 1 Peter. Now, uh, we're fortunate here, if you've been coming to Sunday school, because Jim is just about to finish up a, a, a very good study on First Peter, and he has really brought our attention to what this little book has to tell us about, and so it should be fresh in our minds. But we understand from the very beginning of the epistle uh, who Peter is writing to. It says in chapter 1, verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So the initial opening of this book gives us insight. These people are considered by Peter to be pilgrims. They're pilgrims because they have been dispersed, all right? They've been scattered. They've been pushed out of their native lands. But I think we could also consider them to be pilgrims because, as the Bible teaches not only in 1 Peter but in other places, those who are God's children are actually citizens of a heavenly city, but they are living in this present earthly place. So we're pilgrims in that sense as well. We're, we're passing through, if you will. We're transients. We're not natives of this land anymore. I wonder how much we think about that, if we really believe that. I, took, I spent some time outside of Missouri in my life. I was in Indiana going to, to college. I spent 14 years in Maine in a pastorate there. I always kept my... Missouri roots, though. I mean, I was born in Missouri and, and raised there. And, and when I was going to get this opportunity to come back and pastor a church in Missouri, there was a part of me internally that was really excited about that, getting to come back home, so to speak, and be near family and, and be back to what I'm comfortable with and what I grew up with. But you know, the longer I'm saved, <laughs> the more I consider who I am as a Christian, the less I like about Missouri. And I'm not talking about the heat and humidity or anything else about it in that sense. I just realized, this isn't my home. This isn't my home. And if you're a Christian, this world is not your home. We're pilgrims. We are folks that are, that are living 
in this world, yes, but we're not of this world, the Bible clearly tells us. It says that they are pilgrims of the dispersion. Our, our New King James says it. The Old King James said that they were scattered, all right? But that's, it comes from the Greek word dispora. So this is a good translation to dispersion. That's what the word is in the Greek. And the purpose or the cause of this is not specifically stated by Peter in this text, but by what he goes on to talk about in the book, it would seem very clear that we can infer from this that they were dispersed because of persecution, very likely persecution based upon their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, Peter reminds these Christian pilgrims of the fact that in spite of their present difficult circumstances, they can and should be rejoicing. How is it that people can rejoice? How can you rejoice as a pilgrim? How can you rejoice as one who's been dis dispersed out of your homeland? Family, friends, job, whatever it may be that you've lost. How is it that you can and should be rejoicing? Well, he tells us why they can and should be rejoicing. Verse 2, because what? They're elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Why can they rejoice? Because they're the people of God. That's why they can rejoice. <laughs> can there be a greater privilege? than to be counted as a child of God, one of the people of God. They can rejoice and should rejoice because they're recipients of the mercy of God. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. They are the recipients of mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. <laughs> What is it that they aren't getting that they deserve? They deserve hell. <laughs> they deserve eternal damnation. They deserve the wrath and the judgment of God upon their sin. But they didn't get that. Instead, they've, got, they've received mercy. And it isn't just that God up in heaven just woke up one day and said, I think I'll be merciful today and I'll just overlook all this stuff. No, no, no. His mercy was bound up in his justice. Therefore, we realize that his mercy is inherently wrapped up in what? The sacrifice of his own son. So the wrath that was on our sin, God did pour out, but he poured out upon his son Jesus rather than pouring it out upon us. And when Jesus fully satisfied that wrath, which we see testified by the resurrection of his body from the dead three days later, then God is able through our faith in Jesus to extend mercy to us because we are justified through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our behalf. So why can and should we rejoice even in the midst of difficulties? Well, we're the people of God. We're the recipients of His mercy. And because, he says, we have an incorruptible, undefiled, unfading inheritance reserved in heaven for us. Look at verses 4 through 7. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We are being kept to this incredible inheritance that Peter reminds us it's laid up in heaven. It's already there. It's kind of like a, a, the scene of a play. You come, this play starts at 7 o'clock. You come into your seat at 6.30 and you're sitting there, but the curtains are closed you don't know what's going on, but behind the, the, the curtain, everything's set up. The, 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 the set's there, all of the furnishings are there, the actors are in their place, and at 7 o'clock, the curtain opens, and it's like, oh, look what's there! Peter's using that same analogy. That's what's going on. All that God has prepared for us is already set up in heaven. And it's being kept by the power of God waiting the time that God says, now's the time. And he's going to pull back the curtain and we're going to see and receive everything that is ours, that is already there. So Peter says, I know you're going through some tough times. I know you're struggling and you will struggle more. The, the book obviously reminds us there's more coming that these people are going to have to go through. And yet he says, you can rejoice and you must rejoice given the fact of who you are in Christ. 
Peter then calls these Christians to live out the holy lives into which they have been set apart by God. They are to live soberly. They are to live obediently. They are to live lovingly toward God and others, for this is what God has chosen and called and redeemed them to be and do. And then lastly, Peter reminds them of the necessity of desiring and partaking of God's holy word. He tells them it's the word of God that has saved them. He tells them it is the word of God that is now maturing them. And it is the word of God, he says, that will sustain them in their present time, trials. So these things, a very brief overview of the first chapter is what has led us up now to where we are here in chapter 2. And Peter is here going to rehearse for these Christians the reality of what God has and is doing in their redemption. And then obviously exhorting them to live accordingly. If this is what's true, if this is what God has done and is doing, then what does that mean for me? How do I respond to that? How do I act in light of that? How do I live knowing that this is the truth concerning me? That's what Peter's trying to get across to his readers, and it's what we want to see this morning as well. And we want to focus it in, in a laser sense to this one specific thing that we're talking about in our church covenant, but would apply to so many other things as well. And hopefully the Spirit will apply it to maybe various things in our lives as we consider it this morning. So here's the questions that we hope the text will answer for us this morning. What is it that is true of these Christians that Peter is writing to? By extension, therefore, what is it that's true of us if we're a Christian this morning? And then what should our attitude be? What should our outlook be? What should our conduct be in light of this reality? Okay, so let's begin. We'll begin with what I would call the reality of Jesus in verse 4 of chapter 2. Peter says, Coming to him, the him here is Jesus, as to a living stone rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. So Peter, writing to these Christians, says that we have come to him, we've come to Jesus, and he describes Jesus here in a metaphor. He describes him as a living stone. In this, these few short verses, Peter overlays metaphor upon metaphor here uh, in, in ways of trying to illustrate and describe both who Jesus is and who we are in Christ. But the majority of these metaphors he uses, we find out, have Old Testament backing. I mean, he's thinking of these things because they've been already talked about in the Old Testament previously, and they're in, in, in Peter's mind, and they become the basis for what he's teaching these Christians. He says that Jesus is a living stone. The word translated stone here is a Greek word, lithos. It was a word that was typically used of stones used in construction. It's not the same word, obviously, as Petra or Petros. We know Simon Peter, the author of this book, his very word, name means stone, but it's not the same word. That stone was basically just a rock, a stone on the ground that you might come across. But this word, lithos, was speaking of a specific type of rock, a stone that was used for construction, that was used in building. And here, Jesus is described for us by Peter as the living stone. One of my commentators said, that seems strange, doesn't it? Don't we sometimes say, he was dead as a rock. We don't think of rocks as living, and yet Jesus is a stone and he's alive. So he's a living stone, and we find out he also has the power to make live things alive because he is the living stone. Jesus, the living stone, we find out, has been rejected by men, okay? So he says, coming to him is indeed a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. Later, Peter will actually reference an Old Testament quotation that he obviously had in his mind when he wrote this in verse 7. He says, he was the stone which the builders rejected, but he has become the chief cornerstone. These Christians that Peter is writing to have come to Jesus. They've come to Jesus, who Peter describes to them as a living stone, the living stone of God. It's interesting, though, Peter, in these few words, helps us to understand, you know, that's unique. Here is the living stone of God, but he's rejected of men. Humanity doesn't want this stone. Humanity has sought to cast this stone aside. Humanity wants nothing to do with him, even his own people. Isn't that what we read in the gospel? Is that he came unto his own. He came unto the Jewish people, his own people, and they received him not. Humanity doesn't want this stone. He is rejected of men, but Peter says he's chosen of God. And therefore, because God has chosen him, 
He's precious. And the intent of being precious here is not the preciousness of Jesus himself, although we know he's precious in his own right, but in Peter's way of writing it, he's precious because God's chosen him. So the one that the whole world has rejected, the world has said, we, we despise this man, we want nothing to do with this man. In fact, we'll do everything we can to destroy this man. We'll put him to death. We want to rid ourselves of this man. He's hated and despised by the world, but Peter says he's, he's chosen, he's precious to God. God loves him. God is thankful for him. God is using him in amazing ways. In fact, we find out that this one that men have rejected, but God has received, has been made now the chief cornerstone. That, that one most important stone within the whole building structure, some see this as relating to the foundational stone, some see it as the capstone that holds the final things together. doesn't really matter. I think Jesus is all of these things and more in this metaphor. But we know he is an important, an integral stone in this edifice that's being built. He is the chief cornerstone. And these Christians, the ones Peter is writing to, they've come to Jesus. They fled to him. So if they fled to Jesus, what has this accomplished for them? That's what Peter goes on to say in verse 5. You also, so these Christians, and if you're a Christian today, he's talking to you. You also, as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. By these individuals that Peter is writing to, having come to Jesus, given the fact that they didn't reject Jesus as the men of the world had done, Peter says, this has afforded these individuals something amazing. The first thing he says is that it has made them actually living stones. <laughs> Coming into contact with the one living stone has made each of these individuals living stones themselves. We were dead in trespasses and sins. We could say it in the metaphor. We were dead as rocks and about as useful. But when we came into contact with the stone who is alive and who is the life giver, those of us who had stony, dead hearts have been made alive. We have become living stones, Peter says. And now, he says, something amazing is, is going on with these living stones. He says, we're being built up, he says, into a spiritual house. The Greek word translated house here is not the term for a house in the sense of where someone would live, uh, a, a human being's abode, but it's rather speaking of, and it's, it's modified here, it's a spiritual house, it's a spiritual edifice, it's probably speaking of a temple. And probably hearkening back to the, to the concept that Paul talked about the church there back in 1 Corinthians. He says, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Not only is each individual Christian the temple of the Holy Spirit because he resides within our bodies, but Paul went on later to say the entire corporate church is the temple of the living God. Because he resides in the midst of us as the church. And I think that's the way Paul, or Peter is using it here. So not only are these Christians the temple of God, they are also, he goes on to say, because they have come in contact with this living stone, they are a holy priesthood. Those who have now been enabled by Christ, he says, to have not only life, but such spiritual vitality and usefulness that they are now enabled by coming into contact with Jesus Christ to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I know in our unsaved state, we have no desire to please or honor God. That's our sin. That's the problem with us. We, we could care less if there is a God. If he's, if he's going to do nice things for me, yeah, okay. It's okay if God wants to do nice things for me, but don't ask anything of me. I'm, I'm too busy. i got my life to live. Quit worrying about I don't want to worry about you. Get away from me. I've got my own things to do here. <laughs> Life's big. It's important. I don't have time to worry about you, God. And no thought for him. 
But now that we've been made living stones, we've got a new heart. We have a heart that's now a righteous heart, a clean heart, a pure heart, a heart that's been separated from our sin. So now the rebelliousness of the sin has gone away. Now we actually have the heart that God created us to have in the very beginning, a heart that understands, oh my goodness, you are my creator. You are my God. You are the one that I love. You're the one that I adore. You're the one I want to serve but we feel like, uh, I want to do this, but I I don't have the capability of doing such things. And we don't in our own strength. But Peter reminds these believers, because of their coming into contact with Jesus, he has enabled them now to become spiritual priests. Individuals who can actually offer up sacrifices that are acceptable to God. Can you imagine doing something that God is pleased with? Those of you who have been studying in, on Wednesday nights with us in, in Leviticus, we've been looking at the, the various sacrifices and offerings that the nation of Israel were given to by God to, to exercise in order that they might continue to have God dwelling in their presence in their camp, that they might continue to have a relationship with God. And we saw that several of those sacrifices, as if it was an animal sacrifice, as the fat was consumed and burnt upon the altar before God, it says it was a sweet-smelling savor that wafted up into the nostrils of God, and he was pleased with their sacrifices. Yeah imagine doing something that you knew God was pleased with? Peter says, now because of our contact with Christ, we have become royal priests, we have become uh, priests here before God, and spiritual priests, and we are able to offer up spiritual sacrifices that God is pleased with and he is accepting on his behalf. Now again, Peter goes on and references Old Testament prophecies concerning Jesus as the great cornerstone and the realities of the people's relationship with him. Verses 6 through 8, we read that. Therefore, it is also contained in the Scripture. So Peter's looking back to Old Testament. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. Unlike to those like these Christians that Peter is writing to, those who have believed on Jesus, he says, now Jesus has become precious to you. Remember, he was precious to God. Now he's precious to us, and why would he not be given what he's done for us? But unto those who reject Jesus, those who have refused him, even though God in his grace has sent Jesus into this world, those who have rejected Jesus and wanted nothing to do with him, he said he's become a stone of stumbling to them. He's become a rock of offense. He's become a scandal to them in their lives. And because this is true, he says, they in their rejection of him have actually proved God's appointment concerning them. They're disobedient at his word. They're not only disobedient at his word in the revelation that he's spoken to us, they're disobedient to the word he sent in flesh. Here is God in flesh. He came to them. He was before them physically. They could see him. They could hear him. They could touch him. They could listen to him. They could fall at his feet. They could worship him. They could beg him for mercy. Did they do it? No. They said, away from me. (laughs) Crucify him. Destroy him. Kill him. We want nothing to do with him. He's become a stone of stumbling. He's become a rock of offense. They are just proving who they are at the heart level. They have been disobedient to the word of God, and they are receiving what God has appointed would be to all those who reject Jesus Christ. So this is the stage. This is what Peter is writing to the believers here. What is the result then? You might say, I get it, Pastor. Okay, this is a great truth. I'm thankful that we're here in 1 Peter today. But what does this have to do with our church covenant, and why would this have any bearing upon it? Well, our church covenant references what Peter writes in these final two verses, 9 and 10. But you, you, speaking again to these Christians, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his, God's own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. Peter describes several things, he says, which are now true concerning the Christians unto whom he is writing. And again, I just want us to be aware of this. It's true of us this morning if we're Christians. First, he describes this as what? He says, we are a chosen generation, beginning of verse 9. The word translated generation here 
Greek word genos, used typically to describe the descendants of a common ancestor. All right? It is a people who share a common heritage, if you will. The word was used in the Septuagint of the Old Testament, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, often when describing Abraham um, and his physical seed. They were his genos, his generation. They are those who are the offspring, if you will, the physical offspring of Abraham. Here in our text, Peter is obviously using it in a spiritual sense, but no less real. These Christians, all of the Christians, are the descendants, he says, of one common ancestor. We're all related. Red and yellow, black and white. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You know, wait a minute. doesn't look like that could be my brother or sister. Our skin color isn't the same. It isn't. I don't think I could be that person's relative. I don't talk the same language they do. Oh, I don't think I could be related to them. We don't have the same customs. Oh, no, no, you, you're missing the point here. It has nothing to do with any of the things that we look on on the outward. It has to do with who we are at the core level of our being. And in this case, he says, we are all genetically bound together. We are a chosen generation. We are of the same common ancestry, if you will. You say, well, who then is our common ancestor? Who holds us all together? Was it Adam? Well, he did in a sense, but I thank God he's not the one Peter's talking about here because all who are in Adam die. No, we're the common ancestor of God himself. How amazing is that? Whether we consider ourselves, as the scripture describes Christians, as the adopted children of the Heavenly Father, or whether we think of ourselves as those who have received new birth, who have been born again by the Holy Spirit of God, or whether we think of ourselves as those who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and then united into a one flesh union with him as our great bridegroom, the fact remains the same. We as Christians are a chosen genos. We are a chosen generation, Peter tells us, of God. And I don't want to get off into something that could be anyway controversial. I just want to say it and point it out as, as being a blessing. We are a chosen generation. Get that for just a second. God has chosen to make us united with him, to make us his ancestors, to make us his offspring. How amazing is that? Then he goes on to describe the Christians this way, a royal priesthood. Peter's already talked about a priesthood earlier, but in that case he called them a holy priesthood. Here he describes us as a royal priesthood. Obviously both of the descriptions are true. Christians are not only set apart, holy, set apart, if you will, as God's priests within this world, but maybe Peter has here the idea that we are also to serve as the representatives of his royal kingdom here in this world. As, peace, as priests, Peter previously stated, we should be offering up spiritual sacrifices unto God. So from this vantage point as a priest, we are a priest who has the privilege of offering up these incredible spiritual sacrifices to God, of worshiping Him, honoring Him, offering up sweet-smelling savor sacrifices, and God is pleased with these things. What a privilege it's given to us as these priests. But now Peter is also talking about us that there is this idea that we are His representatives, okay? We can be representing who God is, Himself, His person, His kingdom, here on this earth as His royal priesthood. So in both senses, Peter says God has set Christians apart, set us apart. If you're a Christian, don't lose that. He set you apart as both His holy and royal priest. Then he describes us as what? A holy nation. The word nation here, ethnos, those who are held together by common laws, those who are held together by common customs, those who are held together by mutual interests. As God's holy nation, his set-apart nation, we Christians are to function within this world, the world in which we are presently pilgrims. We are supposed to be functioning in this world according to his laws, we are to be functioning and living in accordance with His way of life. We are to be living out our existence here, desirous of the things that make up the worship and the service of our God. 
This obviously harkens back to Peter's description of these Christians as pilgrims, transients in a present land, currently dwelling here, yes, but living in this world under a different set of laws, customs, and pursuing different interests. Is this something that resonates with you in your Christian experience? Again, as I stated earlier, it resonates with me more and more. The older I get, the longer I'm in Christ, the more this resonates with me. And God's calling for me is not to be so wrapped up here, but to be different from here. To be a representative of him here. Now, we know this. All Christians are earthly citizens. We want to think of it in our sense. We're citizens of what our city, state, or country in which we presently are located. Are we supposed to represent that? Yes, of course, we are to a certain degree. And Peter, in this epistle and other places within both the Old and New Testament, we are commanded by God to be good citizens here for the glory of God. But Peter here is also rising beyond that and reminding us that we can never lose sight of the fact that this is not and never will be our home, our land, or the place where our true interests must lie. As it was written of Abraham back in Hebrews chapter 11, we should be seeking to establish our, not seeking to establish ourselves here in this realm that is soon to pass away, but we should be rather looking and longing for a coming city whose builder and maker is God. I was thinking in my office about that statement that Jesus said, what would a man give in exchange for his soul? If a man could gain the whole world, but lose his soul, what does he have? And I was thinking about that in light of what Peter says here. It, 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 and I want to be careful because we need to draw the lines lightly because both of these things are important. But I do think, I, I struggle with it. I have to keep telling myself this. I can get so wrapped up in saying, I've got to fix this. I've got to fix this. I've got to fix this. <laughs> what if we could make the United States of America perfect? What if we could make it like the New Jerusalem? What would we gain if we got that but lost our own soul? Is this really what we're living for? Or is he what we're living for? He came into this world, the very world he created, but the world said, we want nothing of you. Kicked him out. Destroyed him. Why do we think if we belong to him, and we're rightly representing him, and we're living for him, that this world's going to treat us any differently. Why are we so attached to a world that hates God and wants nothing to do with him? And one that Peter will go on to say in his second epistle, there's coming a day, it's going to be burned up with a fervent heat, and nothing's going to last. So we should be living for something different. That's what Peter's driving at here. But he describes these people as his, God's own special people. The word translated special comes from a Greek word here that means something that's acquired or treasured as one's own, a private possession, if you will. The old King James translated it with the word peculiar, which I'm sure was a, a great term in their day and age in the way in use, which peculiar was used, but in the way vernacular has changed, I think, at least I do, I think of the word peculiar as strange. And I get it that as Christians, we are going to appear strange to this world, but I think sometimes Christians have latched onto that and said, yeah, I'm supposed to be a weirdo in this world. I don't think that's what Peter had in mind here with the world. He wasn't calling us peculiar in the sense that we're strange for strange sake. The word really meant special. It meant it was something that belonged to God. And because it belonged to God, it was precious. Just like Jesus was precious to God, we're precious. We're his special possession if you will, his treasured possession. Can I say it this way? Of all the people in the world, if you're a Christian, you are a part of the people of God. You make up the people God has chosen to call his own. You say, that sounds awful arrogant. No, because that has nothing to do with me or you or who we are. It has everything to do with the grace and the mercy of God and his credible love with which he loved us in Christ Jesus. 
But I don't want to, at the same time, when saying this has nothing to do with who we are, we're not worthy of this, I don't also want to say, lose sight of what Peter wanted these Christians to understand. And remember, in the context, it's pe people who, who are suffering because they belong to Christ in a world that hates Christ, and they know they're going to suffer. Many of them are going to lose their lives because of the cause of Christ. What's going to make them stand there as somebody is setting them on fire to burn his tiki torches in the emperor's garden? Blaming them for having done something they did not do. What is going to cause them to stand there? Peter says, you know what's going to cause you to be able to stand there and take it? Is to know this. You are the prized possession of God. You are His special treasure. If I was His special treasure, why would He make me suffer? Because God's trying to help us to understand this life is not what it's about. This isn't even life in God's economy. The life that we have in God is here. <laughs> it's something man can't take from us. Because it's held in the hand of God. And it's the only thing that matters. Because the moment that they, those Christians were set on fire, and the moment they breathed their, breathed their last breath, and it may have been a tragic last breath, I'll give you that, but the moment they breathed the last breath, there was God. Welcome home, my child. Welcome home. Look what I prepared for you. Enjoy. Feast. Rest! Know me. Enjoy me. Be thrilled with me. But God, 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 look what I left behind. There'll be none of that in God's presence. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim <laughs> in the light of his glory and grace. <laughs> this world is nothing in light of the glory of his grace. So if this is true, and Peter says it is, under the inspired word of God, we can believe it's true then what should this cause us to Christians to think, understand, be, and do? Well, he, one of the things he tells us it should do in verse 9 is what? We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may what? Proclaim the praises of him. Proclaim the praises of God who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What should this, if this is true, what should it do for me? And you, for us, what should it cause us to do? Proclaim His praises. Proclaim His praises. Why? Why should I proclaim God's praises? Because He says, you know what? God has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. What had sin done to you? Many of you in this room had the same experience I did, a, a joyous experience to be raised in a Christian home by Christian parents who, who shielded me from a whole lot of filth and garbage and gave me really basically humanly understanding, a great upbringing. Praise God, I'm so thankful for that. But you know what? No matter their best intentions and their best efforts as godly parents, the one thing they couldn't do was change my heart. And my heart was wicked and vile and filthy, and dirty, and totally depraved. In spite their best efforts, you know what? I was a sinner, condemned unclean. I was in darkness. I was in bondage. I was in hopelessness. I had nothing of meaning or value. Peter says, but you know what God did? He took you out of that darkness and he put you in his marvelous light. I stand in the presence of God and I'm accepted there because of Jesus Christ. He ought to be praised for that, he says. And he says, he goes on to say in verse 10, who were once not a people, 
but are now the people of God. Again, even though I was privileged to be raised in a Christian home, some would say, I'm a Christian. No, I'm not a Christian because I'm raised in a Christian home. I'm not a Christian because mama and daddy were Christians. I'm not a Christian because being the youngest of five, my four siblings all trusted Christ and now we're Christians. That didn't make me a Christian. I wasn't a part of the people of God. I was an outsider. The wrath of God rested upon me in my sin, and rightfully so. I wasn't part of the people of God. But you know what Peter says? Praise God, because now I am. He's maybe, we who are not a people, a people. Now we exist. And, he says, at the end of verse 10, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Again, mercy. Not receiving what we deserve. Again, the wrath of God was abiding upon us in our unsaved state. We were without mercy. But now, we are the recipients of mercy. Peter says, I think that's something to rejoice in. Peter says, I think, I think the whole purpose in this letter is, I think Peter's saying, this is something that can sustain you. In the darkest day of your life, the most difficult circumstances man could ever face, this truth, Peter says, can and should sustain you. It will sustain you. The reality of who you are to God through Jesus Christ. You are the people of God. And thus our church covenant states, having been led as we believe by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, being made by God into a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people of God's own choosing. The last words of the first paragraph. We, the people that this is true of, we do now joyfully affirm our covenant together. If we have been born again by God's Holy Spirit, and if we have publicly professed our faith in Jesus for salvation by obeying Him and following Him, believers' baptism, and if we understand that this has made us part of God's holy nation, part of God's royal priesthood, part of the people of God's own choosing, then what will we do? What should we do on a practical level? Our, constant, our covenant encourages us with these words that we would joyfully affirm our covenant together. In other words, that we would bind ourselves together as the people of faith. We would bind ourselves together as the people of God that the Scripture says we are. While we cannot covenant together with all of God's people on earth, this is a physical impossibility, we can covenant together with those within our local congregation. That's something we can do, and I would dare say it's something we should and must do. And what possible reason could there be for not wanting to do that, given the reality of what this text tells us? You say, well, I just don't like giving myself to anything, but we give ourselves to all kinds of things, don't we? We pledge our allegiance to our country. How many times have you stood up? And... We pledge allegiance to the United States of America. We might join some particular political party because we agree with the things they're trying to stand for and do. We unite to construct an athletic team for the cause of just playing ball. We'll enter into a covenant with a bunch of people. I'll eat certain things, I'll practice at certain times, I'll be at a certain place at a certain time, I'll do a certain responsibility, also I can be part of a team. We partner together to create companies or corporations. We sometimes enlist in a branch of the military. We will pledge ourselves. We will enlist ourselves. We will give of ourselves to all sorts of organizations, all groups. And I'm not saying any of those things are inherently wrong in themselves. But I would ask us as Christians this morning, as those who are recipients of what this text has said here, what other group of people could there possibly be that you would be more desirous to align yourself with, to give yourself to, than the people of God. 
And I would ask us each scripturally this morning, what other group of people, what other organization are you going to be aligned with for all of eternity? Because at the end of the day, all of these other groups and all of these other entities, they pass away. The only group that is eternal is God's people. So we can make covenants and pledges with all other kinds of people, but no matter what, there's coming a day. That's going to cease. But we're covenanted together with God's people. We're not only covenanted here in this life, we're covenanted for all of eternity. And we will spend all of eternity covenanted together as God's people, worshiping Him and serving Him. Our church covenant exists as the necessary result of being made part of the people of God of recognizing that I have become a member of the body of Christ. It represents and testifies of my joyful, and that is something I think it should be, voluntary allegiance to a local representation of God's holy nation, a representation of God's holy priesthood, a representation of His special people, which He has chosen for His own glory. Our church covenant represents our pledge to live out this special bond that we all share in Jesus Christ. So I ask you this morning, are you a born-again Christian? Have you followed the Lord and believers' baptism? Are you covenanted together with God's people? If not, why not? What biblical reason could you give for not being? Father, I pray you challenge us this morning with your word. I pray you'd help us to understand Peter's point here in bringing these realities to bear in the lives of these Christians. Father, may we be able to take it and use it in our own hearts, lives, and experiences to understand the amazing truth that is here, not because of anything that we are. We certainly deserve none of these amazing things that are stated here. They are all ours because of Jesus Christ. They are all ours because of what you chose to do in and through your Son, your incredible grace, your mercy, your love. But when we did receive new life through faith in Jesus, all of these things came true. And they are a reality. Whether we believe it or not, it's still a reality. As we come to grips with what your word tells us is true, then what is the outcome? What should be the result? What should we live and do and be because of these things? And I think at least one practical thing is what we're talking about here as a local church our willingness to covenant together as God's people. We realize how unique this group is and, and how much it is set apart in this world that is against you, dear God, and against your Son, Jesus Christ. We realize how important and vital a covenant is. And may we see it, may we desire it, may we enter into it. And those of us who have entered into it, may we then take it seriously and live it so that we can fulfill all these purposes and desires. Thank you for your word, Lord. Use it in our hearts as you see fit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.